Kim to thank for um, dedicating his, his, his life's work to uh, promoting this medium that we uh, has enriched all of our lives. Um, and without further ado, um, I give you Kim Thompson. Hello, thank you all for coming here despite the weather. I'm glad to see uh, such, a, such a nice turnout here. Um, I've been a fan of Tardy since the 1970s, and as uh, Larry pointed out, a professionally involved with it in one way or another since the 80s, when I did that first uh, translation for Raw Magazine. I've actually done work on Tardy in just about every decade since then. We published Tardy in the 80s, or, or the Rod in the 80s, we published him in the 90s. We started this new series in uh, the 2000s, and uh, we are continuing to do so. Um, the thing about Tardy is that uh, his uh, work has been translated actually quite a bit, as you can see, in English uh, and uh, imported into the U.S. It's done, been done in a pretty uh, erratic and whimsical uh, way and not very much at all in the order in which it actually appeared or in a coherent way. Uh, a trend that continues to this day uh, as even our series of Tardy reprints, which are on number five and going to number six, have been bouncing madly around uh, in terms of uh, when the book was first published. In fact, of the six books we've done so far, I'm including the six which is not yet published, two he did in the 70s, one in the 80s, one in the 90s, one in the aughts, uh, one he did last year, and one he did half in the 80s and half in the 90s. So it's a little hard to keep track of it. And one of the things I hope to do with this little presentation here, which basically covers his 20 major books uh, from when he started until now, is a sort of give people an idea as to the arc of his career and uh, his work in general. And uh, otherwise, uh, just uh, show some very nice examples of his artwork. So uh, we should just get started. Um, like, all like all French cartoonists back who started back in, uh, uh, before, the, uh, before the 80s, uh, generally work was published in weekly magazines. And uh, they're really weren't graphic novel uh, formats available, except uh, after the serializing publication, uh, and it was mostly for kids. So he entered, he was last, one of the last people uh, to really, of the major cartoons, to enter into that generation. Um, and he started, therefore, at what was the most, at that point, mature, edging into maturity of uh, the weeklies, Pilot Magazine, uh, which is best known as the home of Asterix, uh, which really launched that magazine into the stratosphere. Uh, it's not, that's not entirely true. Uh, they're actually, uh, in the 60s, there were the first uh, examples of more adult graphic novels that were published particularly by a, an outfit called Eric Losfeld. Uh, they published in particular the uh, Barbarella, which everybody knows, although not necessarily for the original comic, and a few others. And a few alternative magazines as well, including a magazine called Ala um, And in fact, if I had given this talk about a month ago, I would have said that uh, Tardy had nothing to do with that, but I only recently learned that Tardy actually did try to submit a graphic novel to Losfeld and uh, was rejected. And I only discovered that. It's, it's very obscure. I found it an obscure book about Tardy put out years and years ago. And uh, basically, I think we probably were kind of lucky they didn't start with that one because it's not really fantastic work. So this is a, kind of a unique look into the very, very earliest of Tardis here, which is kind of cool just on that level. And uh, you can already see one of those who are familiar with his work and see one of his uh, graphic fixations, which is uh, that uh, vertical black and white uh, wallpaper, which is kind of neat. But anyway, that was uh, a, a failure. Uh, I don't know how far he got. I've only seen three sample pages of it. And he essentially entered into Pilot Magazine, where, like, other aspiring cartoonists, he did a bunch of short stories. Um, now, anyone who knows Tardy knows that one of his big obsessions is World War I. And the first story that he really did to submit for professional publication after that other thing was a story called uh, A Banal Incident in the War of the Trenches, which he submitted to Pilot and which was rejected. So, and this is a sample from that. Um, and uh, again, Early 70s work there. Uh, once again, his uh, you know his obsessions were with that, but uh, at the time, there really wasn't much interest in publishing that. Uh, the French have a uh, are a, a an iffy relationship with uh, their history and their wars, particularly in media that were intended for kids for the most part, 
or were, one could perceive, a satirical intent. Uh, there's a very high degree of sensitivity. So his first attempts to actually deal with that material were met with uh, pretty much indifference and rejection. So he bumped around and uh, did short stories here and there, again, mostly for Pilot magazine. Here is, uh, here is an example of that. Uh, he was a, I think, somewhat clumsy artist. He's not one of the great natural cartoonists. Um, his, his early work, I think, uh, suffers from a bit of stiffness and uh, not great as design. But he's one of those guys who really worked and worked, and after a number of years, became really one of the best artists, as opposed to you know natural draftsmen like Robert Crumb or Jaime Hernandez, who basically was a brilliant draftsman from the day first, you know, took a pencil in his hand. Uh, here is another sample of his early work, um, going into this World War One thing from a different angle. Uh, American comics fans will look at that and think, uh, boy, I wonder if he ever uh, saw American comics like, say, Joe Kubert's Enemy Ace, because uh, there was a definite uh, similarity there. And uh, in fact, yes, he did. Uh, <laughs> a few years back when he actually, uh, they, when they produced a, a, a book collection of his old stories, and uh, that's his own avatar there, the old wrinkly guy, uh, talking uh, autobiographically, he talks about uh, how uh, big an influence actually Joe Kubert's work was on him graphically. Uh, the contents, not so much. He dismisses uh, uh, most of the, uh, all the American war comics as being kind of fatuous, but uh, graphically, he's a big, uh, big Kubert fan, uh, one of his influences. And he even did uh, a Western, uh, proving mostly that he was probably not born to draw horses either. <laughs> um, but uh, eventually, uh, like all uh, European cartoonists, um, you essentially have to do albums. And um, he uh, was uh, joined together with uh, one of Pilot's staff writers, a guy called Pierre Christin, whom uh, French comics fans will know mostly as being the writer of the Valerian series. And it was basically, uh, the first was supposed to be a series of books uh, set in uh, contemporary France uh, with a fantastic and sort of satirical element to them. And uh, it was not exactly a Tardy's area of comfort. Um, uh, it, uh, he is, uh, although he, he appreciates the experience as his first graphic novel, he said it was kind of slog to work through. And um, it is pretty much nobody's favorite Tardy book. It's, uh, it, uh, and uh, not only was it not very much appreciated by the public, uh, but the publisher wasn't wild about it and actually never, never released it as a, an album. It only got released as a graphic novel several years later when uh, he released some other stuff and by a different publisher, uh, which was kind of the first of his uh, scrapes with Pilots and uh, their, uh, uh, their publishing arm, uh, album publishing arm, Dargo. So it exists mostly as a curiosity, and I can say as someone who plans to translate just about every Targi book that I possibly can until I retire or die, uh, is that that one would be at the very, very bottom of the list. So if this, if this looks at all intriguing to you, uh, learn French. <laughs> but even, even that said, I mean, you can still see that there is a, a strong talent there, and uh, I don't want to minimize the actual quality of the work. Uh, but uh, there's, there's supposed to be a certain goofy element to it, and uh, you know, fun little strange characters, and he just never, never quite felt, felt it. Uh, so, uh, what he did instead, one thing you need to do, um, and I can also add that, as a matter of fact, that Christin then went on with that series uh, called Les Gens d'Aujourd'hui, and uh, more stories in that vein, and he linked up with another cartoonist called Enki Bilal, which then turned out to be a smashing success and did a number of books with, and really launched Bilal's career. So sometimes it really is just a matter of casting, and in that particular case, they just cast the artist wrong. Um, so, at that point still, what you needed was you needed a character, and uh, what Tardy did was he created this character called Blanda Blan, uh, and he just went back to uh, his obsessions, which is uh, pre-World War I graphics, um, mad scientists, mad adventures, crazy stories, and created uh, essentially a book-length adventure of this character called uh, Blanda Blan. Um, and that's the first time I remember seeing Tardy, in fact, and being puzzled by what these strange stories were doing in my Pilot magazine. Uh, more airplanes still, and um, again, and more mad scientists. 
And again, this work was uh, really not a huge success either with the public or with the publisher. And especially when, as a follow-up, he wanted to do a story set in World War I, uh, they essentially canceled the series from under him, said he could like wrap it all up in one 10-page story, and didn't really want to do an album of the work again. Uh, so that didn't really get very far. Um, and that was basically the end of his involvement with Pilot Magazine and uh, Dargo, except for this one, uh, The Arctic Marauder, which happens to be the book that we just published. Um, it's, uh, you, have a, you can see it certainly the display there. Basically, this uh, was a fun experiment he did um, where he uh, took a whole bunch of old plots and ideas and notions from classic science fiction works, particularly Jules Verne, and yep, there it is. <laughs> and what he did, and it's not, <laughs> and it's not so visible. It's not so visible on the, on, on the, the screen there. But he did with this incredible fake wood grading thing uh, style that he uh, that he used scratchboard for. And uh, essentially, what he had to do for every panel was he had to draw it on scratchboard. Any of the parts he wanted to do scratchboard effects on, or woodcut effects on, he had to fill completely with black. And then he had to buy all these weird old utensils that looked like cones and sort of scratch the ink back out from over them. Uh, which he discovered about a few pages into it was really a hell of a lot of work. And uh, he actually slogged through the entire book explore never, never again. Uh, this is also, I think, the first, I would say, the first instance of playing around with textures and formats and ways of, uh, of uh, indicating, uh, of having uh, colors or blacks or grays. Uh, this is actually a, sa uh, a sample page. This is not something you'll see in the book. Uh, this is one that he did just as practice before launching into the actual book. The book itself looks like more like this. And again, it's blurry enough you can't really tell, but uh, after this is done, you know, go over and have a look at the book, have a look at the, uh, at the, the display. It's really quite spectacular. Uh, the story itself is, kind of a, is, is very much a goof. It's just uh, um, he himself calls it uh, an... an, an uh, a shameless, uh, a shameless ripoff of Jules Verne, which is true. He's kind of put a bunch of Jules Verne on the stories of the mixed master, and created the story of a couple of disgruntled mad scientists who want to uh, destroy the world. Um, yep, those graphics all look better when I saw them on a computer screen. But trust me, they're they're really gorgeous. And uh, the uh, the. <laughs> the distinctive thing of this, uh, which kind of reflects uh, Tardy's uh, deep cynicism, is that the, the uh, is that the brave young hero, about two thirds of the way through the story, simply converts to evil and uh, gets together with the evil scientists. And uh, fortunately, you don't manage to destroy the world, but uh, it's a little bit little bit of a bummer there. And to give you an idea of how, uh, and again, lots of machinery. Uh, I, I've been calling. Uh, I've been trying to uh, to to coin, I coined the word ice punk to describe it. And I've actually seen a couple of reviewers picking up, so I'm hoping that uh, people will actually start calling it that because it is very much like steampunk, but ice punk, but with ice. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of the opposite of steampunk, if you wish. Uh, and if you look, and I've actually looked up on Wikipedia, and uh, he is actually credited as one of the uh, early members of sort of the steampunk uh, movement of uh, classic science fiction, sort of reinvented with a satirical intent for uh, you know for current and. Just to show you, this is actually not from uh, that book, but this is actually a Gustave Doré uh, <coughs> uh, illustration from a book that he inspired by. And if you look at it, there is an illustration in uh, The Arctic Marauder that is extremely close to it. Uh, again, uh, screen resolution not so great, but uh, trust me, it's, well, it's Gustave Doré. So anyway, he did those books uh, for, uh, for, for Dargo. One book, they refused to release as a book. The other two didn't do well, got really slowly, and uh, got, uh, got remaindered. And uh, he said, OK, I'm out of here. At the time, though, uh, there had been a rise in small alternative publishers. And what he started doing is uh, stories for them. This one is called The True Story of the, of the Unknown Soldier, as it says there. And shows him really sort of move, morphing into his mature style, uh, black and white, very designy, very strong character, very strong character design. It's basically a semi-long, uh, not quite a graphic novel, a long short story. It's a series of hallucinations from this hack writer, who at the last on the last page, again indulging a lot of his obsessions with uh, that technology from that period, who on the last page turns out to be all the hallucinations flashing through his brain as he's killed at the end of World War I. 
and in fact he turns out to be the unknown soldier. He's the one who is buried under the Arc de Triomphe. A story that someone like Pilot probably would not have accepted, but that uh, he found another publisher to do with, to do it with. Um, he also did uh, Polonius um, for a Metal de Law, and uh, this, if uh, you are were a real old-time American, you know, comics reader who's picking that stuff out, that actually did a few in heavy metal back in the 70s, uh, although nobody noticed. Uh, it's uh, it's a classic, you know, slave, uh, you know, gets into uh, the whole uh, Roman Empire type thing. Uh, lots lots of slaves, whipping, depravity, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> Emperors molesting small boys, everything you possibly want, that kind of story. And there you go. Uh, I'd say it's probably one of uh, Tardy's minor works. It's uh, one of those where the articles about them all will start out saying, although usually considered a minor work by Tardy, there is all this to consider about it. Uh, but uh, again, one of those that probably is going to be at uh, the sort of the, the end of my list of books to do. The his certain, first exposure in the First exposure in the United States, yeah, 1977. Hence the uh, the 32 year figure I give the, the time it took him to break into the U.S. Uh, it's actually technically a science fiction story because uh, I don't have it there, but there's a panel and they come across an old locomotive. So it's actually in a post-apocalyptic future Roman type thing, which I guess is how he snuck it into the Mattel which is supposed to be science fiction. But you need a character, and uh, and what he did was in 1976 he found a publisher and a character named the Adèle Blancsec. Uh, which is probably the one that most people are familiar with, which has been already been reprinted uh, to a large degree, is by far his biggest popular success. And um, I don't think I really need to talk too much about it. There's a, the, the iconic first page of it uh, with the pterodactyl about the ready to come out of the of the, of the egg. It essentially takes his, 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 it takes place right before uh, World War One, and it takes his like dark and cynical obsessions with you know the misuse of power. And, uh, the, and of science and about just the, the general shittiness of humanity and injects it into this period, uh, this pre-war period, which he likes mostly for graphic reasons, but uh, also just because the subject matter works. It was almost like the last period of hope in Europe. And uh, he just basically runs with it. Uh, there have been nine Adele books to date. Uh, they come out sporadically. He did the first four of them, uh, blam, 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 within a three-year period. They slowed down and started devoting himself to other work as well because he now could afford to do so, coming back to Adele periodically. And occasionally they'll drop Adele for about a decade and then come back and do it again. The last one was 2007. And nobody really knows. Uh, I've been told that uh, he plans to finish it off with two, uh, the double volume or two more volumes. But uh, you never know. Uh, he always plays his cards pretty close to the vest. And uh, the fact that uh, he had some problems with his longtime publisher, Casterman, in the last decade. And then the fact that the movie came out, directed by Luc Besson, that was uh, received mixed critical response, apparently so. And uh, for all I know, he's been soured on Adele. We'll never see the rest of it. Uh, I think he's very much a guy who you know will do whatever he feels like, and we can, we can only hope. I certainly plan to release all the Adele stories that have appeared to date. Uh, as I said, of which there are nine. Although we're releasing them in two books per volume, so once I get to volume nine, it's going to be kind of tricky. So I'm hoping that, that he will come through with one or two more volumes. Uh, it's lovely stuff. Uh, note again, you'll see uh, vertical wallpaper there. Um, very playful. Uh, sometimes, the first time you read the books, actually, you probably won't make much sense of them because the plots are so complicated and convoluted, and, and that's part of the fun of the whole thing. Uh, Tardy is, is, is against the, uh, the death penalty, so that comes in very well to play. And uh, all the albums end with these great, like, uh, to be continued, what's going to happen next uh, kind of things. Uh, I'm told, I don't know if this is true, this might be apocryphal, but for the last few albums, when he's hit the point where he has to promise what the next album's going to be, uh, he, he, makes, he has one of his kids just make up a title. And then whatever title the kid comes up with, he just has to work his work around, which seems charming to me. But uh, that, that is Adele. And then we come to Fatal. Uh, Fatal, uh, Jean-Patrick Manchette uh, is one of the great noir, again, French crime writers. He did a series of about 10 fantastic short novels in uh, France in the 1970s. And um, Tardy, who was always a fan of detective and, 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 and noir fiction, got together with, with him and he decided he was going to do an adaptation 
uh, a book of uh, that the Moshe was writing at the time called Fatal about a uh, sociopathic uh, female uh, murderer, basically, uh, who celebrates her murders by uh, apparently, according to the story, at least in the physical instance, uh, with with sauerkraut and walling around the sauerkraut and the money naked, <laughs> which is a great uh, a great concept. Um, <laughs> And, and uh, he worked really hard on it, and in fact he worked uh, hard enough that he actually experimented and redid some pages uh, using uh, the, um, using a, a uh, I just forget what, what's that called, the, the tone, the, the tone, not duotone, but uh, craft tin, cra craft, craft tin, yeah, he experimented with craft tin. So. But for some reason, after doing 22 pages, uh, the project was abandoned, it was never published. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, I'm in contact with Monchette, uh, the writer's son, who says his theory is that Charlie realized that the story, after the first murder, is almost all no action, it's just talk. Uh, she situates herself into this little town, and uh, he probably just may have given up on it. So, possibly, uh, to uh, you know, as, as an apology, what happened is that Monchette went and he actually wrote an original story for Tardy, which Tardy then illustrated, called Blue Fruit. Uh, so, Fatal actually is a non-existent book, uh, and Good Fur um, was the first uh, was one of the books that we published with his that appeared in. If anyone has old issues of Pictopia, three of the four issues that serialized, and uh, it's just a, a great, violent like all the uh It's just, it's it's Tardy's first noir masterpiece, I would say. Uh, all the later ones were probably better. It's just a lot of fun, uh, and they, it's got vertical water, wallpaper as well. Uh, the worst thing you could say about it is that at the time Tidy was working very fast and very, it was serialized two pages at a time and uh, you can see one of the results of that is the character's face changes pretty radically from the first to the last page. <laughs> and, uh, and it ends as badly as you could possibly want it to be. Uh, he basically uh, ends up uh, bleeding into death uh, amidst the trash, uh, laughing to himself at the irony of it all. Very, very French, very noir, and I realize I kind of blew the ending for you, but uh, I don't feel bad because, because the cover of the book is actually in the later book is there, so it's not like he was hiding it. So that was Molchette, uh, and we'll be coming back to Molchette, as I'm sure you know. Uh, then, um, at the time, uh, Casterman, uh, his publisher, which did not have its own regular monthly or weekly magazine, decided to launch its own magazine called Astriable. And what they did was uh, that they um, decided to really launch the idea of the graphic novel as novel, which is not using recurring characters necessarily, uh, letting cartoonists do as many pages as they want, not stuck to the usual 48 or 64 page uh, formats. And they essentially hired uh, Tardy to be kind of the, almost the face of Astriable, because at that point he'd already accumulated a large amount of respect. And in fact, there is the first or number zero issue of uh, Astrid Blue, and you can see Hugo Pratt as part of it too, uh, other cartoonists uh, such as um, Comes and, um, and other major cartoonists. And Astrid Blue really became during the 80s the rallying point for the new serious graphic novel uh, and, uh, uh, in, 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 in the French comics, and uh, Tardy did most or all of his work for them for a very long period. Uh, and this first story, uh, again, uh, you are there, or as it's called in French, ici même, uh, because it's a very complicated punning thing that was a bit to translate. Uh, and it's basically this uh, surrealistic story uh, set, uh, you know, about a hundred years ago, about uh, this half-mad heir uh, who's, uh, whose ancestors are almost screwed out of all their ancestral lands except for the walls that exist between the lands. And so he makes his living running around in these walls and collecting and it's a very funny satirical story. It's actually written by um, uh, Forrest, the guy who wrote Barbarella. Uh, he'd originally tried to sell it as a movie script, didn't work. He'd originally tried to sell it to other cartoonists. The movies turned it down, a few others turned it down. It kind of ended up with Tardy, and in retrospect, looking at it, it's impossible to tell to see how anyone else could have possibly been you know, perfect for the job. Uh, it's uh, definitely one of those early masterpieces. It's, uh, it's not an easy read. It's not the most accessible of Tardy's works. And uh, it was probably a dumb idea to release that as one of the first few, but uh, I kind of figured he had to do that to sort of set the bar for what Tardy was capable of. Uh, still got wallpaper there, as you can see. Uh, and basically, uh, the story that, that uh, of this poor guy 
and his attempts to sue his way back into his ancestral lands gets mixed up with a political scandal. Uh, that woman sort of goes between the two worlds. Uh, it, uh, uh, it turns kind of surreal, and by the end of it, uh, <laughs> things just, uh, he's just floating off into, 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 into nowhere. Uh, the, the, the town is burning up, the, 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 the military is called in. There's been, uh, it's just a complete, uh, a complete clusterfuck. And uh, it's been called satirical, although Forrest actually rejects that. He says it's just a, it's just a ripping good yarn, just ideas put together, and he completely rejects the idea of satirical at all, which may or may not be true. We can't ask him anymore because he died a number of years ago. So uh, Tardy got the idea of uh, doing a noir, and uh, he moved on to a guy called Leo Mallet, who was one of the other great uh, French noir detective writers. And he started a series of adaptations of his, uh, of his of Nestor Burma. Uh, from this point on, actually, uh, Tardy did a lot, started doing a lot of adaptations. Uh, but at this point in his career, he was either doing his own writing or he was working with cartoonists who with cartoonists had written for him. Uh, I'm not sure why he didn't do adaptations earlier. Maybe just, you know, that uh, writers didn't want people to work uh, to do comics and, uh, versions of it or whatever. But anyway, this. Kind of is the first of that. Um, it's just uh, there he is with Leo Malay. It's a cool photo, and it's just a really, really good detective story. Uh, he would go on to do four more there, and probably his longest-lived collaboration. Although it's um, not a collaboration so much because it is an adaptation. Uh, Malay did, who was alive at the time, did license it to him and did okay it, but uh, he was doing it all on his own. Um, and uh, if you ever wonder why people don't do more detective, detective, detective stories in comics, probably because the last few pages always have to look like this. <laughs> sure, I will, I will project a little bit more. So that's, that's one of the reasons that you see very few detective stories in comics is because toward the end they start looking like this. And uh, Tardy can pull it off, but it's not something that necessarily everyone can. Uh, another uh, collaboration is Cockro uh, Roach Killer. I keep on calling it Cockroach Killer. I think that would have sounded better, but Roach Killer is what it was called. Uh, this is a story that was set in New York. Uh, another interesting experimentation that he did in terms of uh, color or black and white, which is the entire book is black and white, except for the protagonist, uh, who is a cockroach killer and who is red. And he, he and his van and everything connected with him is that. Kind of like uh, the, the little girl in uh, the little girl in uh, in Schindler's List, but with a cockroach killer. Did he spend much time in New York? Do you know? Uh, he was in New York. He took a lot of photos, uh, and visually, uh, the uh, it, it, it's absolutely impeccable. Uh, the problem, and I discussed this actually with Art Spiegelman, who wrote the introduction to the first, uh, is that it's it's off kilter in the way that a lot of European when Europeans do stories about New York or the U.S. or other countries are, and obviously with the same vice versa when Americans do it. And he said that really in order to, you know, to sell it to Americans, you have to sort of sell a sort of off-kilter, slightly wonky view of, uh, of America. Uh, for instance, the central premise of it is that uh, he stumbled on the conspiracy by accidentally pressing uh, the, uh, uh, the button for a 13th floor in New York. And as it says in huge letters, there are no 13th stories in New York. But there actually are, so it kind of is <laughs> confusing. And uh, the, the thing that Spiegelman told me the greatest analogy you could think of was to think of uh, the uh, Kafka as Unfinished America, where there's an early scene where the ship comes sailing in under the well known Statue of Liberty brandishing a sword. <laughs> and um, so I'd like to do that sometime. It was released by NBM uh, back when, um, and probably next year we'd be collecting it along with some of the other New York based stories that he did. Um, and again, uh, that introduction saying, no, don't take this too seriously. But uh, yeah, visually, he actually he was there for, lot, there for a while. And uh, it's, uh, it's too complicated to explain what goes on there. But uh, it's, uh, it's uh, definitely a, a Frenchman's view of America, including a Jack Kirby superhero going arg, <laughs> which is cool. And a giant shootout, which, as we know, happens in New York every day. <laughs> And in the last sequence of it, after uh, the conspiracy has uh, completely brainwashed him, he walks around and all the backgrounds actually turn to photos. And that's, uh, it's a little hard to see there, but actually 
Only he and his van and the red are there are, are, are drawn. The rest of his photos. It's a, it's a fascinating story. Uh, it's it's a good one. As again, most of his are. Uh, then finally, he, he gets a chance to go back to uh, his number one obsession, and um, this is actually a chapter from it. it was a War of the Trenches. It's done in a huge, uh, like giant volume, done sort of as a uh, as a parody of old timey picture books. Uh, in fact, the, if you've seen the uh, the, the cutout, the little uh, that uh, that I put together there, that's from that. Uh, what it contains is the first 16 pages of what will become the War of the, War of the Trenches book. Uh, done in full color, printed only one side, and uh, it basically launches that that part of his uh, part of his work, and uh, it's as as cheerful as you would want. Um, then in 1988, he died, tried to already been illustrating a number of books, but uh, one of his. Uh, Huge inspiration is uh, the writer Céline, and if you've read Tardy and if you know or have read Céline, you can see that uh, their sensibilities dovetail pretty much. Uh, that it's extremely dark, you know, ultraviolet level of humor, view of humanity, um, uh, very anti uh, anti authority, uh, anti anti government, anti army, anti war, and uh, he did an illustrated version, or rather a series of illustrations for uh, Journey to uh, the End of Night. Uh, I think about 130 illustrations. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting book, as you can see. And what's kind of it, what's interesting about this to me is that uh, even though he's working as an illustrator, it's actually not very illustrative in terms of, it's a, done with very rapid, thick, actually more cartoony than his other work, which is very interesting. It's like he went dramatically, the, Opposite direction of which you expect one to work as an illustrator. Uh, it's not, again, not so visible here on the screen, but it's uh, like his, his roughest, most you know, thickest, quickest. You can tell he did a lot of them very, very rapidly, but uh, very living. And uh, that served as an inspiration, I think, for this, which was his third Leo Malay book, uh, where he suddenly changed his style to an extremely rough, very cartoony, and with colors added, and very. I would say almost a parody there. Uh, it's, it's, it's probably the biggest break in the style. And uh, you can tell he's not taken seriously by the fact that uh, for a lot of the actual story, uh, he's actually wearing a clown nose, literally. Uh, he's doing, working with like, a lot, more, lot, more, lot rougher lettering. I get the impression that he almost didn't pencil that. And uh, for someone at that point in his career, it was kind of reinvigorating because uh, working in what you call the clear line style, his, other, his work tended to be a little bit stiff, maybe. Uh, and uh, this kind of like broke himself free of those constraints. And even though he would go back, as you can see in his later stories, to uh, sometimes that style, you can see that he's sort of been almost loosened up. Uh, although once in a while, the cartooniness will uh, jump in, as you can see in that <coughs> dog in the first panel, which is kind of funny. This is from a, a later, this would be from a later Nestor Burma story. Uh, so, and then we come to it was the War of the Trenches, uh, which actually was done over a period of a number of years. He did the first few chapters in 1982, then he left off, and then left it for a decade, came back, and finished off in 1993. All of the published in Australia, uh, it's uh, pretty much inarguably his masterpiece, uh, I would say. And uh, it's, a work, it's a work of, of passion and rage and despair, and a bleak, bleak sense of humor in there. It's actually, in its own way, it's funny in moments, but it's got a you know beyond gallows humor, guillotine humor, maybe. Uh, and again, as you can see, he's working in a very, there he is working in a very illustrative style. It's like he's, he's certainly aware of the seriousness of the subject and he brings it not just as a game, but a sort of, this is, you know, this is what it is. Uh, it's, none of it is from the political, you know, view of things. It's all from the grunt side view, all from what they had to suffer through. And it's all, you know, this, this is this hard, you know, we must not repeat it. Wasn't yeah, this uh, the first is this the first story that you translated? Yeah, yeah. Into? That was from that was from round number five. Is the first chapter of that. But to give you an idea how long it took him to do, that came out in 1983, and he completed it in 1993. So it's still a decade before you finished it in France, let alone got published anywhere else. And it's had like a, a borough publishing history. It was that published in raw chunks of it were published and drawn in quarterly. But uh, we finally put the whole thing together last year. And uh, and that's the first collection in English. The first collection in English, yes. And oddly enough, we're actually selling it now to Europe, and they're importing it back into Europe 
so that uh, they're selling they're selling it in uh, museums devoted to World War One, World War Two history for tourists who don't speak French, which is actually kind of cool. And it's uh, it's, it's it's not a happy book. It's, uh, he actually lists uh, lists the cost of war. Uh, and here you can see where he's found a sort of way between the, that previous style and, the, and, and, uh, and his normal style. Uh, this is another adaptation, another uh, noir detective story set, uh, set a, a few years ago with a bunch of kids. Uh, it's done in full, it's full color. It's one of his, uh, his, his first really full color major graphic novels. And again, it shows him just, uh, and there they are, uh, killing the victim. Uh, a very a very strong book again. Um, very. He, he, if you look at the first, it's a little hard to see there, but the, he just has this enormous skill to be able to uh, work from photos and represent landscapes with this very loose and yet very precise style at the same time. Uh, he's one of the two cartoonists I know who can do that. Uh, Crumb being one of the others. In fact, I would argue at this point that probably Crumb and Tardy are the two greatest living cartoonists in the world. But that's just my opinion. Uh, police brutality, of course, uh, like in any tardy, any good tardy book, any good noir book. Uh, I'm hoping to do that one probably in a couple of years. Uh, it's, uh, it's 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 a fun book, and of course, bad end for the protagonists. It may be hard to see there. He's about to get run over by a train. So that's another one that I'm sure that most of the, those who you read tardy is another one. The visual ticks is the the death scream, which is a series of A's in a long balloon that just sort of goes into nothing. Uh, I've actually been reading over a lot of books and uh, of his, and I, have, I don't know if there's a single tardy book that does not have someone at some point screaming that series of eyes. Uh, this came out in 2001, uh, and I include mainly because it actually shows uh, how, at this point, to what degree he was willing to just jump into anything, because it is set in modern day Paris, is done in full color, it is completely the opposite of all his sensibilities, and it's something he did just because he wanted to work with a writer called uh, uh, Pinnock, who, who was also a uh, mostly <coughs> mostly writer of, uh, of crime fiction, but also with satirical. It's a satirical story about uh, a uh, a guy who gets himself locked into the zoo as uh, as a laid off worker, and uh, then it becomes a detective story, and he's found hanged and. Uh, Hijinks and Sue. Uh, again, mostly it's, it's interesting, I think, here to see just because of the way that the charity has actually managed to integrate. If you compare that to you know, the color work from that first story I showed way back when, you can see how much looser and easier he's become and how he's able, at this point, to work you know, on any subject matter that he wants to. Uh, it's, uh, again, that's one that probably we'd be translating at the end of the run because it's very French, it's very specific satirical. Uh, the, uh, but it's uh, it's fun. I just actually reread it today to familiarize myself with it, and it's uh, it's it's a quite enjoyable book. Uh, and here we go back uh, to um, this is this is this is a pretty amazing book. He did this in 2001, and uh, the ambition of it is pretty staggering. It's actually a 300-page book. Uh, it's based on a book by Voltaire. It's uh, a uh, again, it's kind of a noir detective novel, except it's set uh, during the French Commune Revolution of uh, 1871, uh, which lasted only uh, only two months. But it, what it is basically is it's a uh, Dickensian, I would say, and, and I think that uh, the character on the left is deliberately there to just uh, give you that Dickensian look. It's Dickensian Victor Hugo style novel that he took and adapted into this mammoth graphic novel about uh, all the stuff going on with as a backdrop this Commune Revolution. So there's politics, there's sex, there's uh, there's violence, there's uh, Revenge is just a, a great old pot boiler. Uh, I hope to do that someday, all this little today, because it is 300 pages, and it's all written in pitch perfect mid 18th century Paris Argo, uh, which which would be a challenge. That, yeah, uh, you could do it. Eh, I could look at it. We'll see. It's, uh, uh, and again, it's uh, at this point you can see that he's just such a uh, I would say a, a self assured draftsman. That you can just tell that every line that goes on there knows exactly what it wants to do with. Uh, it's it's again just that rough style, but still clean. Uh, it's just it's just fun to look at. And again, you'll see someone there screaming ah. <laughs> <laughs> and 
he has he has a skill that the uh, cartoonists tell me is, is, is difficult to do, which is that you can actually work from photographs and integrate it so it doesn't look like it's from a photograph. And this, I think, would be a perfect example of this. Uh, that uh, um, it's uh, it's it's another cool one. And again, he uh, it was originally released as a series of four volumes, and you can see just the the density and complexity of the plot with uh, the uh, you know the serialization of all these things, what's going on, all these characters. It's, uh, it's, it's a fun story. And uh, here we come to uh, another book of ours that we did, West Coast Blues, the Petit Bleu de la Côte West. Uh, he basically uh, reunited with Monchette. Monchette, unfortunately, passed away in the 80s. Uh, but uh, Tardy had always felt, I think, that he never really did justice to uh, Monchette. And so we went back and he adapted one of his really good uh, early books. Uh, or not early books, they were all in the same period, West Coast Blues. Uh, this came out in 2005, and uh, I don't really know if I can say much about it, except that uh, it was the first, the book that we chose for our first release, largely because I wanted something recent, and also because I thought it was really accessible. It's uh, and, uh, very, very noir, very violent. Uh, it, um, Moshe's novels are actually very, very short and uh, very succinct, and they're very easily adaptable into comics. He's worked on uh, his novels several times, and it always comes out really great. Uh, the story is the story of uh, a guy who works uh, works in an office, and he gets uh, he's he's bored, he's sad. Uh, he's, he spends his uh, nights getting drunk and driving around in circles on uh, the uh, on the Paris Beltway, and he stumbles into an assassination attempt, and uh, his life falls apart. And actually, he lives more and has more excitement in that period as he tries to dodge the two killers who are sent after him and deal with that. But, uh, and uh, all sorts of terrible things happen. And at the end of it, he managed to get through it all, but he still just goes back and he's still circling eternally uh, on, uh, the, uh, on the beltways. Uh, Tardy, actually, the most recent book he's done is yet another Monchette book. It's the one that I'm finished translating, in fact, just last week, uh, called, uh, uh, the original title of it, title of it is, uh, is uh, La Position du Tureur Couché, which I translate as, uh, <laughs> like a sniper lining up a shot. Uh, it's, um, it's, I don't want to, uh, it's, it's a great story, and obviously Tardy's on a real manchette kick at the moment. I'm told that the next book he's going to do after that is going to be yet another manchette adaptation. Uh, and look, there's a plane that all startled me. <laughs> They're awful close. And uh, the last of the 20 books that really, I think, determine Tardy's career arc is uh, from just uh, 2008, Putain de Guerre, which really translate as fucking war, which is one of the reasons I haven't done it yet, because I have to figure out what to call it. <laughs> <laughs> and that probably will, will, won't fly with a distributor. <laughs> and what it is, it's another series of uh, stories, obviously from World War I, uh, but this time done in uh, color. Uh, and with longer stories, uh, and uh, the book itself actually contains about one third of it is actual historical notes and uh, photographs and such. Uh, so it's one I'm looking forward to do. Uh, the color gives them a chance to, you know, have pleasant things like green meadows, which somehow look a little weird in my looking at World War One stories, or red, and uh, white and black and white. Gradually, the book actually turns more and more gray and black and white. Uh, it's um, and there you have it. That is uh, where Tardy is at at this point. So I hope you enjoyed just you know this walk through Tardy's. Uh, oeuvre, as we say, and I promise that uh, as long as people are actually buying it, we will keep on releasing more and more of them, and I uh, hope that the many of the ones that you've seen here and others, and ones you're still working on the future, will be brought to you in uh, readable English. And if not, as I said, you can always learn French. Well, the operative <laughs> word there, well, let's give Kim a big hand. Yeah. The operative word, as long as you keep buying them, <laughs> we have uh, the, the books here. I'm sure Kim will be uh, uh, gracious enough to hang around and answer yeah, any questions. If anyone has any, I mean, if there's anyone with any specific questions uh, about Tardy or about European comics in general or about the fanographic in general for that matter, you know, I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah. Well, maybe we can do that informally and uh, yeah. uh, so we can sell books right now. Let's give yes. you another <laughs> hand. Thank you, Kim. Thank you all for showing up. I did want to point out that. Uh, we have one thing here that, that, that I think is making it pretty much its American uh, debut. Um, 
it's a, it's a Jacques Hardy diorama that Kim made reference to, and uh, it's just spectacular. It's actually free um, if you buy hundred dollars worth of books. And uh, you can basically, or, basically, if, or, you have, if you have if you have a pair, if you have a pair of scissors and a pot of glue. Uh, you can actually build that in two hours. That's how long it took me. And so, <laughs> and it's just it's just like right behind me here. And it's just adorable if you like people bleeding to death in little cute yard around us. Oh. <laughs> At any rate, no, thanks again, Kim and Don. And I also want to thank uh, our friend over here at uh, um, Georgetown Records, Martin Inback, for playing all the, a fellow Francophile playing his go-go uh, music from France. It's a collection of seven inches. So thanks, Martin. Go ahead and spin a few more. Thanks. <laughs> Oh,